I'll hang out. We'll go out together, you know. And they have that. We develop a rapport, a, a level of trust that's different than, than most people will do. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a mindset, mindset and a lifestyle that we... That we that I try to push and I try to push other people to do as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. have you ever seen? Now I know in the wellness space this is happening quite a bit, um, and the art spaces. Mm -hmm. Are there people who are advertising martial arts and tying it into mental health or wellness? Some of them. Okay. Some of them. How do you feel about that when you look across the landscape, like? A, how do you feel about that? B, what do you think that they're looking to accomplish? The people that are doing it? Yeah. Um, the people that are doing it, mm -hmm. I can say my instructor does a very good job of it. Um, not just for the kids, but for the adults. And in our school, we do ages three all the way up to any, mm -hmm. you know, there's no cap on it. We got people in our dojo, or our, in our dojang that are as young as two, three years old. And we have people that are as old as 75 years old. Um, but the way that he ties mental health into it, he always gives a nugget of feedback after every session mm -hmm. and he ties it to how you get through your days in life. Mm -hmm. It's not just, Hey, y'all did a good job today. Y'all did a bad job today. This is what we need to work on. And that is what keeps people coming through the door. And his, his, his mantra is passion over profit. Mental Health Monday. People, people could tell that you from somewhere. Yeah. By the way that you talk, the way yeah. you walk, where you carry yourself. Like, he not from here, but he from somewhere. He from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's Philly, New York, Jersey. <laughs> you got some. Yeah, you got some. Man, you know, like, oh, okay. You know, and that's why too, like people. I, I do a lot. I used to do a lot of work volunteering with kids in um mm -hmm. in uh, the juvenile detention centers here in DC. Yeah. And a lot of the kids would be like, "Oh, you not from here? Uh, you pussy guard." But I'm like, ask one of these guards in here, and I tell I'll tell you where I'm from. But they'd be like, "Oh no, nah, he really." <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's like people they say you're oh, from southeast of yeah, love respect i'm from mm -hmm. baltimore love respect i'm from philly love respect chicago love detroit wherever the case may be yeah but because every single one of those areas where we're from where where you got southeast dc baltimore uh uh you know all over the place philly mm -hmm. you know chicago wherever the case may be it's like all of those neighborhoods and areas have developed a reputation for themselves on the map that at yeah. one point had been some of the roughest in the <coughs> Brick City. Brick City. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah. that's the thing too. And we like, don't even have that many bricks in North that's, <laughs> that's why it's always made it hilarious to me. It's called Brick City. But, like, when you look at the buildings, the establishment, how many bricks are really in Newark when yeah. you, like, look at it, right? Yeah. And then the difference of knowing, like, Newark versus Newark. Yes. Yes, yes. And it, like, you know, we don't need to explain that. That's an inside. <laughs> it's, a, inside. it's some inside information. Yeah. My girl, she always tell me, she be like, why y'all talk so aggressive? <laughs> <laughs> Just get the temperature in the room, that's all. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. It. that's like, it. You know, even before that, like somebody mm -hmm. would ask me, she be like, why do you... Even my friends now, they're like, why you walk like that? Why you always looking around? I'm like, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. It's like everywhere I'm looking around. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's definitely growing up like that. Like you said, the most important point, like you have brought up, was I think growing up in Jersey, you it's going to get done. Yeah, it's going to get done. It's no, it's, it's no, it's I'm, gonna gonna, I'm not going to do it. I'm yeah. going to come back to no, it. We're we going to get it done. We're going to get it done. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's that, that like you said, it's. Newark versus Newark, Newark yeah, you know. two different places, two different cities. Like I got a homegirl from EO, and she mm -hmm. she grew East up. Orange. When people started calling EO, I mean East Orange EO, I was like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> okay, all right, all right, okay, guys. And she said she heard my girl say she said, "Oh, you, you in Jersey?" I said, "Yeah," because we'd always try to link up even more in Jersey. She mm -hmm. still lives in DC, but yeah. she'd be like, "Oh yeah, I'm going to Ambassadors." Mm. And my girl be like, what's ambassadors? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Staple of the hood. Too. Nah, nah, definitely, definitely. 
But, hey, what's good, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Get Home Safe Mental Health Monday. Here, my boy, Sherm. What's good, boy? What's up? What's up? How are you doing? Chilling, chilling, man. Chill. Chill. Of course, man. Thank you for pulling up, man. Let the folks know who you are and what it is that you do. Uh, My name is Sherm. I am a uh, personal trainer as well as martial arts uh, uh, instructor and student, very much a student here in the DMV area. Um, and just trying to change your lives one day at a time through fitness and health. So that's what I do uh, outside of work, outside of my day job. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's the importance of martial arts? Um, martial arts is really like uh, a way of teaching people life skills, it's a way of teaching people patience, compassion, kindness, uh, restraint, um, and, and de escalation in a, in a number of Mm-hmm. So that's really what martial arts is. Before it's about kicks and punches and learning how to lock people. It's not. It's not about that. It's, not, it's about really, really controlling yourself and dis. And we 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 live it. Discipline of mind, body, spirit. That's really what it is. So and and trying to encourage and instill that in, in others and in the community. So so boxing. What got you into it? Um. Just overall, like when I was a kid, I got like picked on a lot. I was always a smaller guy. Yeah. Um, like, how small were we talking? Do you remember, like, the height, weight, and stuff like that? Oh, man. It started, like, middle school. Um, I had to be, like, five, three, five, four, maybe. Mm. Like, soaking wet, 130. Okay. Okay. 120, 130 pounds. Um, and I was a smaller cat, smaller guy. I always wore glasses. Um, just, I was a target, you know, skinny mm-hmm. kid, glasses, you know, didn't really have much size on me, um, and people just always, you know, thought they could pick on me, I hadn't came into my voice yet, my body hadn't filled out yet, none of those things, so I got picked on a lot. Did you ever look at your parents' DNA and be like, one day y'all niggas gonna get it? <laughs> um... Nah, like my father was the one to really have to, you know, push that and inspire like the 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 the, the spirit of like an animal in me, I mm-hmm. guess, more or less. But yeah, um, he 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 got me into, you know, boxing and self defense and martial arts and things like that because I remember I came home one day, I had to be maybe like twelve, thirteen, mm-hmm. came home from school, and at the time it was this girl that I liked. Um, and you know, I was like middle school crush, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, it was one of those big first crushes. Um, she wasn't even giving me the time of day, but I was so just like enamored by her. Um, and one day a guy in her class, uh, I think it was at recess or something, had stole a basketball that I bought to school. And he took it and ran with it. And I was chasing him, chasing him, chasing him. And I always wore glasses since I was like, I don't know, six years old. Damn, that's that's yeah. some real security then. Yeah, having it that early, you know, I got you keep on. So I had glasses. I was six, and you know, <clears throat> everybody that knew me at the time, we the school that I went to. Yeah, most of us had known each other since kindergarten, first grade. You just moved up into different levels, but um. Mm-hmm. So does that mean like past beefs came with you, past crushes came with you too? Um, in a sense, but it wasn't yeah. really like beef for real. For real, it was more like you know, like he's an easy target. Small kid with glasses, and it was a small young black kid with glasses that like, you know, going to school with a bunch of rich white kids. Even uh, though the girl that I had a crush on was black, yeah, the guy who was picking on me was this white kid, and you know his parents had very good connections with the school, and you know, very very good donors, stuff like that. It was a private school, yeah. So and, everything um, was just not stacking up for you. Wasn't stacking up for me. So yeah, he, I had a basketball ball to school, put it to recess. He took yeah. it, and I was running, boom, 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 running down, running in the playground. I'm not looking. I, I trip over something, look down. By the time I look up, there's a sign. This is my head hit the sign. Boom, glasses fell off. And you can just hear the sign vibrate like, uh, 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 uh. and everybody just gathered around me. And I got in the car that day after school, and I get in the car, tears running down my eyes, and crying. My father's like, What's wrong? I said, like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and he said, Well, you can tell me what happened, what happened. I told him what happened. He said, You know, you need to learn how to start defending yourself. And I was, um, sixth grade seventh grade at the time and he tried to keep pushing me into martial arts at the time he had a friend who uh he went to high school with my father went to Barringer. okay um 
and he had a friend that he went to high school with that was a martial arts master. And he said, you know, come down to the dojo, start training with us. And at the time, I didn't really want to. I was soft, you know, I didn't, I wasn't really thinking about stuff like that. And um, he was like, you need to learn how to defend yourself. Somebody messes with you out here, you know. He's like, you go into school in the suburbs, but you still live, we still live in the hood. Yeah. You know, um, so, and he, he, that was my start for me, and it was bigger than, at the time when I started, it was just me learning how to defend myself, but the connections that I made within that were bigger than, you know, uh, just throwing punches and kicks and stuff like that, so that's how I started, I started in a karate school with my father, one of my father's good friends, um, who, his son that I'm really good friends with to this day, we went to preschool together, me and his son, and that was my start before I started doing martial arts and self-defense boxing was the start for me. My first four years was boxing and wrestling. In high school, I wrestled. Mm -hmm. So that was my start. Dang, that's that's an extreme contrast to mine. Mm -hmm. I was fat. <laughs> <laughs> right? I think like <clears throat> third, fourth grade at some point, I just started blowing up just in food. Because like when you're Jamaican, man, it's just like everything tastes good. Like you don't mm -hmm. have a choice when you're Jamaican. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like all cuisine within Jamaican cuisine is just like, oh, you guys don't know how to not make anything taste good, right? That's true, yeah. And then you just start putting on the weight because, like, in my house, when you're Jamaican, parents, which I think it's important, they're like, look, we need to instill everything that's Jamaican, especially when it comes to cuisine and food in this shop because when you get older, you don't realize, like, you are going to be the taste tester of your culture when you go out with your friends. Mm -hmm. Hey, is that the right spot? Hey, do they do it correctly? Hey, do they do it like us? Mm -hmm. Is this something that's weird in fusion or are they doing it the traditional way? Mm -hmm. And I mean, being here in D.C., we've seen a whole bunch of spots that have gone fusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then certain spots that have stuck tra to traditional and then other places that have like gotten it right where you're like, oh, you guys care about what you're doing, how it looks, how it's presented. Like, I don't know uh, if you ever saw on Twitter, they did um, the oxtail egg rolls. No. Yeah, I saw oxtail egg rolls. And one of my folks had it, he's like, nah, they were bomb. Mm. And I was like, all right. So in D.C., that was the first time that I was exposed to steak and cheese egg rolls. And I was like, they've now made oxtail egg rolls. Crazy. Mm. Where did you get the <laughs> oxtail egg rolls? I got it, my boy, up in front. I never got them myself. He said he got them. He's Jamaican. He got good taste buds. We've had food together. He's tested. He made them. No, no. He went to a restaurant to have them. In, in the DMV? In the DMV. I gotta, you got to let me know. What that's, <laughs> I got to check that out. Oxtail egg rolls. Yeah. But for me, anytime I had like moments of fighting, I fought a couple of times in middle school. It wasn't anything major. Not like on the level that you experienced, but... When I went to the park over in East Orange, I used to get my ass whooped, bro. Mm. Like, my dad would be playing tennis on the courts. I'd ride my bike up to the park. It was always like, uh, when you was on Sunnyside Terrace, that's usually like five to seven blocks away from the joint that's like in between East Orange General. My mom worked at East Orange General. Okay. So for me, it was like just riding a bike, head over to the park, try to have a good time. They got me into swimming because they wanted me to lose weight. And instead of them wanting me to defend myself, because they were both law enforcement on like on the island of Jamaica, but when they came here, they were just like, look, we're just going to work ordinary jobs. Mm -hmm. And like, I just remember fighting, not, not religiously, but there were like a couple of situations where I was just like, fam, why am I getting my ass busted right now? Mm -hmm. I was like, wait, my dad goes hard. My mom goes hard. Why am I wild pussy right now? I was, <laughs> I was like, no one's going to teach me how to fight. I just, I just know how to scrap. Mm -hmm. And I think, the closest thing to martial arts my parents ever put me in was like fencing mm -hmm. and i was like this isn't gonna fucking work i was like you guys you guys just want to raise a kid to be in the books and study and do well i'm not gonna make it if i'm getting my ass busted and you guys just tell me to win and no one's telling me how to throw a punch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or how to kick someone correctly or like you know figuring out vitals you guys just want me to have an education and as long as I'm able to wake up the next day whatever happens in the fights it's just cool and I was like nah I'm going to just take care of this shit myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and that's really just how it is for mm -hmm. everyone has a different story so hearing your story I'm not shocked but it's just like I'm glad your dad had the resources and you guys had like the right people around you to facilitate things 
Yeah, and he never forced it on me. He just yeah. said, "You need to, you know, learn how to defend yourself." But like, it was something he realized was necessary for you. Yeah, but at the same time, it was like he. It took him some time to get me mm -hmm. to go and stay. At first, he. I think it was two or three times, and I said, oh, "They don't tell you that shit's hard when they start." Yeah, they don't tell you like, "Hey, the thing that you need is probably gonna suck more than the experience you've had." Yeah. But when you come out on the other side. Not only are you going to be better for it, you're going to start to recognize certain things about the quality of people. Definitely. And that's what I think people, I think you hit the nail on the head there. People don't realize, like, it's, it's so much more than throwing the punches and the kicks. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's mental. It's spiritual. It's, it's, it's emotional. Mm -hmm. The physical is, like, the last part. <laughs> they teach you that when you walk in. Mm -hmm. But the physical is the last part, and I tell people that all the time, so... Did you ever have moments while taking these martial arts? Did you ever get immersed in the experience? Do you ever think there was like one point where you like so immersed you kind of like one day woke up and looked yourself in the mirror and you're like, oh damn, we here already? I'm not. I'm like that now. Okay. I'm like that now. As we we go into, I'm, a, I'm about to be uh, just one two two steps below black belt. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's you got all these different franchises out here, Tiger Showmans, and these, these they don't really teach you how to, you know, um, really be a true, true martial artist. But, you know, I, I see now I'm immersed in it because, and you, to, to your point, it's like, you know you're immersed in it when you have done it enough, when you've been on that mat, you've been in that studio and that dojo enough, where you've trained to the point where you're trying to tell other people that ask you, Hey, and you, I have so many friends who oh, well, I wanted to fight this guy, I wanted to fight that girl, blah, blah, blah. And you realize you're immersed in it when you are the one trying to be their biggest advocate mm -hmm. for de-escalating a situation. Yeah, because I think you and I have a, a better understanding of this now because of the work that I've done for like 10 years on that side when it came to U Street and stuff like that. Like, I remember, yeah. Most people who want to fight don't realize what it really means to fight. When mm -hmm. there's no refs, mm -hmm. when no one stops it, mm -hmm. when people can take it to the extreme, and you could like lose something vital, whether it's respect for yourself, whether it's your life or someone else's life. And then like with the introduction of technology and phones being able to record everything and everything being like for world star hip hop and for the net and everything else mm -hmm. that has really escalated what was simply a disagreement into something that's like a whole different realm that most people can't handle. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that people don't see. They don't think about you in, in, in their mind, a fight mm -hmm. is a fight. Yeah. Right. But they don't think, what if one person records this and then they put this on social media and then my employer sees it or my parents see it mm -hmm. or my colleagues, my counterparts see it? Your whole life could change in an instant and say you do one thing that you didn't mean to do. Yeah. You could hurt somebody and potentially, God forbid, even kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, it is, is, it is very, uh, you have to be very careful with, with even fighting in general. And a lot of times people have asked me, they said, why are you just letting people put their hands on you? I said, because you're not looking two years down the road, three years down the road, mm -hmm. one hour down the road, you know, yeah. law enforcement is coming. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's with that person that you may be fighting. Someone popping their trunk 20 minutes later. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you <clears throat> do something and you defend yourself, you may think you won that fight. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, I'm going to go to my car. I'll see you later. You know, and all of those things. And, you know, growing up with the way that we did, in the area that we did, yeah. that's very common. A lot of people don't realize that. So, you know, it's very much about thinking and being, being able to control the reaction. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, most folks are like, I, I think there's, a, from my work that I've done, actually, when I was over on you, I was the manager for that establishment at Velvet Lounge. Mm -hmm. And... I just happened to be at the front because, like, you just needed a reliable door guy. So I was the door guy, but I was actually the manager that held the paperwork and, like, was running the establishment. Mm -hmm. Most nights you guys came through. Mm -hmm. Privately, people don't need to know who the manager is unless they say, hey, can I talk to your manager? 
Mm-hmm. That's just how life works. Mm-hmm. So most people have never seen me fight, but I fought quite often while running that establishment. And mm-hmm. I tell people like, hey, the smartest thing you can do in a fight is figure out how to end it quickly. Mm-hmm. When you end a fight quickly, it takes away from the emotion. It takes away from the impact of something being dragged out. I think the longest situation we had was this dude just got out of prison, mm-hmm. right? And he came into my establishment, and he had a good time for two hours, because, you know, I greet everyone, so I see everyone, and I'm a good measure of everyone that came into the establishment. We had a situation at the bar where he was too drunk. <clears throat> when you come out of prison, whether you're too drunk or not, you always going to have those hands on you. That's just how mm-hmm. it works, right? Mm-hmm. And I let him know, hey, man, we're going to have to actually leave. You had enough for the night, but, you know, you could come back tomorrow. We always had an open-door policy. Look, mm-hmm. if you messed up today, good time's over. But it's technically our job to protect the good time, and you being this drunk is not the good time anymore. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> when I told you, a homie swung on me in the club. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he like, you remember how Velvet was set up right mm-hmm. by the staircase coming forward? Yep. He was right at the corner between the staircase. Mm-hmm. He pushed me, right? Mm-hmm. That was his first mistake, creating mm-hmm. distance, right? Mm-hmm. And he did a, um, what's it called, a telephone hook? Where you can just see the punch coming from a while away. Yeah, he he did that, right? Yeah. Did the hook. I deflected. Spun him around, right? (laughs) He he put two jabs, and it was just easy because he was drunk. And then I just stiff-armed him, Uh and I stiff-armed him across the whole bar. Going down, right? (laughs) Now, (laughs) Now, that's embarrassing. That's already embarrassing that your first one missed. Your second two on the follow-up miss, and they were good throws. But for me, I was just like, "Look, this is just what I do." Yeah. Right. And remember, I was doing like the football and everything else. Mm-hmm. And, like my hands were exactly where I needed them to be. Yeah. And it's yeah. just like everything was just moving in slow motion for me, right? And then he fell off when I pushed him off the edge of the bar, right? So he's on the floor. That means I'm giving him time to get up towards the back door. <laughs> no, not towards the front. Oh, I was so you started him, in the back. I started in By the, the back, bathroom. and I stiff turned him all the way across the bar to back the front. To the fell right. Yeah. That means I'm giving you time to get up. Yeah. He gets up, right? And then he starts throwing more. And as he's throwing more, it was like one, two, because it was two hooks, which I was like, I don't know why you would do two hooks. Because, like, mm-hmm. just that body movement, like the muscles you could pull doing a back-to-back hook, mm-hmm. if you're not trained, mm-hmm. I was like, good God. And then his boy tackled him, right? So now he's trying to fight me as his boy is tackling him, trying to get him out of the establishment, right? Yeah. Two more swings, one kick. Nothing connects with me the whole he time. Tried to kick you? Yeah, because <laughs> when his boy's pushing him, that means your arms are taken care of. But when someone's pushing you, you can technically twist it enough for a kick. Yeah. And I'm just like, you really wanted to fight that badly for someone said, hey, come back tomorrow. Yeah. Like, think about that. Yeah. It was on a yeah. Friday. Come yeah. back tomorrow, right? Got him out the door. He's like, hey, man, that's fucked up. And I said, you're not hurt. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> like, like. When it comes to alcohol and everything else, especially one of those establishments, there's some people who have problems and there's some people who just don't understand the concept to know. Mm -hmm. And in moments like that, I usually tell folks, because like, I've had to do things to a lot of folks and talk to them five minutes later, right? Mm -hmm. That's like my most polite way to put it. And I'll never like say who did what or what was involved in anything, because like, there's a certain amount of embarrassment that people sacrifice when they get into these situations. And 10 minutes later, they realize... What, what, what did I think I was going to be able to accomplish? Because, mm-hmm. like, for the most part, there's only one person in the city who I'm their story. And at that time, they almost lost their life 10 minutes into the situation where I never threw one punch. Because, like, as a manager inside your establishment and outside your establishment, there's certain things you're allowed to do. Mm-hmm. Right? So inside of an establishment, you can defend yourself as a manager. But once you get outside and it's more of the public sphere of everything that's going on... You don't ever want your establishment to have a manager that is fighting people mm-hmm. on the outside. Mm-hmm. On the inside, whatever happens, things are going to happen. Things are going to get out of control. Now, once you're on the sidewalk, everything's a lot calmer and things mm-hmm. are going. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're just limited in the retrospect of what you can do. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that. Yeah. I think you're probably like the first person I've told that story in totality to. And you said there was another person that they almost lost their life? Yeah. What happened was he was one of our regulars at the time. And he was someone who, 
in a lot of aspects, I think they were questioning what side of their sexuality they were on, and then in their confusion, they started to project on women in the wrong way. Okay. And we had an incident in the back where one of our security uh, kicked out someone else. And when he came to the front, my boy was like, yeah, hey, he's done for the night. And I was in the middle of talking to him. Because after you get kicked out, there should be a moment of transparency and calmness where it's like, hey, man, you come here all the time. You've been coming here for months to years. You've never been this kind of issue. Mm-hmm. What's going on with you? Mm-hmm. And in the middle of me asking him what's going on with it, with him, and it was really like you could see the vulnerability wash over his face and yeah. see that like, oh nah, he really wants to know what's going on. A man came out, he was like, Oh yeah, him he can't come in here either. And I was just like, How's it gonna start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's building up. Fam. Yeah. And yeah. what happened was I looked at my man, I was like, Why would you say that? And right when I looked back at homie, he just sucker punched me, just right in the moment. And it was like, what I do? <laughs> right? In his drunken stupor, he probably thought that you he said what your man said. Oh, he was sober. He was sober. Okay. Yeah, he was sober. He, he was you, you have a good measure of, of when people are sober. Nah, he was mm-hmm. sober. So my man came out, tackled him to the ground, and was fighting him. Right? And at this point, my face wasn't damaged. But he had a handful of rings. So I had like a little scratch Mm -hmm. on my face, but nothing major, right? So I break up the fight. And when I break up the fight, in the middle of me breaking up the fight between my guy and this other guy who used to be our regular, he hits me again, right? It's it's like every time I'm looking away, that's when I get hit on the turn back. And what happened is, if I'm not mistaken, right here, Mm -hmm. it's like my lips a little bit swollen. His ring cut through my lip. And cut this whole thing open. Wow. And what happened was the homies on the block pulled up. And I can't say anything that happened after that. Because we on camera. Mm-hmm. <laughs> His just, people. Just, no, my people. Your people. Okay. Yeah, Your yeah, people. yeah. Because whether you, whether you want to or not, when you become a staple in the community, the community people. is going to want to protect the folks that have done right by them. And that's what that situation became. And that's why I usually tell folks I'd rather we not have a situation because when people defend you, there's no longer a blurry line of what overstepping is. Mm-hmm. When when you've done right by people, when they found peace in what you've created, and when folks have been able to share so many parts of themselves with you, and they know you're not here to damage the community or embarrass the community or do wrong by them, mm-hmm. they are going to do whatever they need to do in life to protect that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's where the most dangerous things happen. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, but back to your martial arts story and your journey, because <laughs> I know right now I'm dropping gems of like, dang, that happened. Ah, okay. I'm learning so much right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stories never told, and like, and then that, that, that's another thing. Anytime people ask for stories, I'm just like, guys, it's not, it's just not worth it. Because mm-hmm. it sounds, I think there's a romance that comes with you work security at a bar and you happen to be a good person. I know you have stories and it's like, even if I tell stories, those stories aren't going to always end the way that you guys hope it would just cause I'm big and strong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's the, that's the, that's the key too. It's like, like you said, you develop, you have developed a, a, a high reputation for yourself. You're a staple in the community. Yeah. And, and, and people, in a similar manner, people want to see mm-hmm. the story that they think they want to tell it. it. Yeah. They want to test it. Some people <laughs> want to test it. Yeah. And then it's the same way. People be like, well, why didn't you fight? Da, da, da. Why didn't you do this with that person? I said, nah, we, uh-uh. Mm-hmm. And for the life of me, a lot of times, people can't understand why we don't do those things. Yeah. They they, they want the, the, the reaction that they think they want to hear about or see. And I'm like, nah, like, and I and I, I tell people I, I've many times they like you know U Street is like the belly of the beast sometimes. I mean, it's a worse beast now than what it used to be. It used to be a beast not with chains, but a beast that had standards. Mm. And now it's a beast that it's trying to prove something, but to who? Yeah. Usually, when people are trying to prove things or something is happening, yeah, there there needs to be a recipient of what's going on, or <laughs> okay. 
this anger, this rage came from somewhere because this, this, and this is wrong. Yeah. And if they're not listening to us verbally, physically, that's the other language that has to be used. Because a lot of folks, they view violence as like something erratic. And it's like, no, violence usually steps on when people are being heard. Mm -hmm. Right? And the other cases of that is violence happens when folks really don't care and they have nothing to really care about and nothing to lose. So it's mm -hmm. like, let me use this form of communication to relay just how much I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a lot of times, like, to your point, sometimes people are sober and other times they're under the influence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a lot of times where altercations start and, and you know, it's, it's just, it sucks sometimes being the one to have to de-escalate the situation all mm -hmm. on your own. Especially like in your situation, you said that was supposed to be your man's and then he's over here enticing the people to, you know. Well, when when he did that, though, that let me know in the back there was a certain amount of frustration mm -hmm. and him having to repetitively talk to people. Mm -hmm. And it just came out at that point. Yeah. So I understand when when my folks are losing it or they're doing that, I'm just like, all right, something has happened back there that I'm not aware of. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. But. The other person's reaction, let me know, like, oh, words words are no longer going to work when it comes to this person. Yeah. And they've come through and apologized and everything else, but it's like, there's a difference between we fought, and that's simply it, versus, oh, you've changed a part of my aesthetic mm -hmm. that doesn't, it won't heal back. Like, when you split your lip... Mm -hmm. I think that thing's never the same. It's too yeah. soft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The amount of fat that you have in your lip is, hey man, whatever happens, happens. You yeah. get what I'm saying? Yeah. And especially like you're talking about like metals, contamination, because you've been split open by, he had like a lion or something, ring or something like that on his hand. And it's just like, you put your hands on someone who has given you advice and led you in a proper direction compared to who you were before we met. Yeah. Because you can no longer come into a bar. Your anger isn't with me or with the establishment. It's with something else that's coming out here. But I no longer have to guide you or care about where you're going after this. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to uh, martial arts and the people that you're teaching, do you consider what you're teaching the martial art? Or do you consider what you're teaching defense? Because, like, as you're saying, when it comes to, like, this romanticized side of well well you're this person who's big and strong why don't you just you know demolish them and it's like when you learn martial arts technically the first thing you're taught is how to destroy a person which most of the techniques are used on you and then that way you learn how to defend yourself and how important it is to defend vital points of yourself mm -hmm. it's it's more like um it's for me it's, mm -hmm. it's it, i don't consider it just like teaching somebody how to destroy people. Mm -hmm. It's more so uh, a, a mindset yeah. and a lifestyle more so. And you're, you're, to me, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's changing lives. I've had people, in, in, in my focus, because I teach kids, I teach adults, I teach all different types of people from all different walks of life. People who are have gone through some of the worst of the worst experiences you can think of. Yeah. And they come to me as a as a seeking martial arts as a solace as a form of solace and comfort but it's it's for me it's it's more so um teaching them life skills you know um it teaches you respect it teaches you compassion it teaches you kindness yeah it, it teaches you how to how to be a better person and after you learn all of those things then you really get into the meat and potatoes of like you said i'm i'm learning how to do these things i'm not I'm, I don't even consider myself well-versed at all. And it teaches you how to be humble. You know, it teaches you how to always think for the potential that there's somebody else out there better than you, bigger than you, stronger than you, that knows more than you. Mm -hmm. And because you train with the best of the best, and I have trained with the best of the best, people's names who hold weight in the martial arts community, you when you get thrown around that mat so many times, you get put in locks so many times, you get hit so many times, yeah. they teach you that. To net, so you know the pain that that feels, and mm -hmm. they teach you that. So when you know that pain, you know how bad that feels on your body. 
Yeah. So you never want to inflict that type of pain on anyone else. Understanding pain is understanding yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, for me, it's it's more. I feel like I don't become a, a martial arts instructor or a trainer. I'm a friend, a companion, a, a, a for kids, a guidance counselor. You know, a a, a, a a life coach, if you will, in certain in certain aspects, because it, it's it, it's it's not people coming in to learn just how to do the physical aspect, but you know, people come to me and they say, wow, you did, I was having a horrible day. You just made my day better. Mm -hmm. I just lost my job. I just broke up with such and such. I just, you know, I was having these terrible, just terrible days, terrible weeks, terrible months, terrible years. And at the, I've had even some people come to me and say, you know, working out with you is the only part of the day I look forward to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the, the mental stimulation and the positivity that training brings to people. That's why I do it. It's more it's not so much about the kicks and the punches and the locks and the holds and all that stuff. It's mm -hmm. it's making an impact. And it's a process. It's a process and it takes time because you I, I will say this, even on camera, ninety percent of the people that I've trained, whether as a martial arts coach or just a personal trainer, mm -hmm. after the first two to three months, yeah. we become friends. Yeah. Then Actually. they get vulnerable. Mm -hmm. They start telling me what's going on outside of training. Start peeling back the layers. Yeah, yeah, peeling back the layers, peeling back the layers. I'm going through such and such with my mom. I'm mm -hmm. doing such and such with my dad. I'm I'm going through these relationship issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I'm going to make ends meet with tomorrow, this, that, and the third. Whatever somebody's going through, they become vulnerable. In it. But, like you said, not everybody can be a teacher. Yeah. Not everybody can be a trainer. Some people are just trainers or teachers mm -hmm. because they just, okay, you're going to come in, do the workout, bye. Mm -hmm. But if you have the, 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 the quality or the character traits like me and you have to pull people in mm -hmm. and make them feel welcome and create an, an, an inviting space, yeah. then they start feeling like, oh, wow, I can really be cool with this person. I could talk to this person. I could hang out with this person. I could go to happy hour with this person. I could train with this person. They could come to my parties. I've, I've many clients that I've had. I've, I've been to their house. They've been to my house. Mm -hmm. um, especially the, 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 the guys that I train too. I, they're like brothers to me now. Even though in the, in the women that I train, they're like sisters to me now. Yeah. And they'll, 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 you know, we'll all hang out. We'll go out together, you know, and they have that. We develop a rapport, a, a level of trust that's different than, than most people will do. So you know, it's 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 a mindset mindset and a lifestyle that we that we that I try to push and I try to push other people to do as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. have you ever seen? Now I know in the wellness space this is happening quite a bit, um, and the art spaces. Mm -hmm. Are there people who are advertising martial arts and tying it into mental health or wellness? Some. Of them. Okay, so how do you feel about that when you look across the landscape? Like, A, how do you feel about that? B, what do you think that they're looking to accomplish? The people that are doing it? Yeah. Um, the people that are doing it, mm -hmm. I can say my instructor does a very good job of it. Um, not just for the kids, but for the adults. And in our school, we do ages three all the way up to any. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no cap on it. We got people in our dojo in our dojang that are as young as two, three years old and we have people that are as old as 75 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that he ties mental health into it, he always gives a nugget of feedback after every session mm -hmm. and he ties it to how you get through your days in life. Mm -hmm. It's not just, hey, y'all did a good job today. Y'all did a bad job today. This is what we need to work on. And that is what keeps people coming through the door. And his 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 mantra is passion over profit. Okay, tell me more about that. So his passion over profit mantra and the, and and his, that 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 model that he pushes is in life we taking everything that we train mm -hmm. and we're applying that to life. And as you're saying, mental health, especially for kids, we take the the passion over profit and show them if you come in here. And you have a half-assed attitude. Mm -hmm. That's the same half-assed attitude that you'll have in school. Mm -hmm. And then that will form into the half-assed attitude that you form when you graduate. It bleeds into everything. And it bleeds into all the different aspects of your life. Yeah. And they said, do you think mom and dad want to be here 
watching you. And he said this literally as early as this week. He said, why would mom and dad tell you to clean your room if it was clean already? Mm -hmm. In the same manner, why would we be having you guys come in here mm -hmm. if you knew it all? Yeah. So in the same way, that's a it, it's a space, for, even for mental health, it's a space where, you know, for the adults it's different. For us, it's like, look, adults don't like the idea of a grown man or woman yelling at them, saying mm -hmm. do 25 push-ups, 25 sit-ups, all these burpees. Walk down the floor, punch, kick, elbow, whatever you the case may be. Mm -hmm. But as adults, that is the 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 hardest challenge for people training as adults. But as it applies to mental health, mm -hmm. you got a guy and a team of people, men and women, that are the best of the best, been put in that made this their whole life's purpose mm -hmm. to come and say, look, pull you to the side in the middle of practice or after practice. You don't seem focused. There's something bothering you. Yeah. We can talk about it. Making that space of the conversation. Yeah. You don't, we don't even have to train. Mm -hmm. I see that you're off today. I see that something's bothering you. Let me talk to you. Let me help you. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I guarantee you that whatever you're going through, yeah. somebody else is going through. And if you don't feel like anybody else is going through it, talk to me so you so I can so you can help me understand more. What, what your plight is, what your situation is, what your unfortunate circumstance is, mm -hmm. so that we can take that and focus on that, and then we'll get back to the training. So, what's I, what were you done though? I don't want to cut you off if you still have more to say. Oh, no, 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 no. So, what's ironic about a lot of the work that I'm doing is, as a community, there's currently a lack of empathy, and mm -hmm. there's this go, 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 we got to go to this, got to go to this, got to go to this, and no one's really focused on the in-between of what's happening as you're moving from point A to point B to point C. Mm -hmm. Like, even when it comes to therapy, I think uh, you were around when I first started Get Home Safe and the work that I was doing in, like, 2019. So mm -hmm. you saw my messaging of, hey, get therapy. Mm -hmm. That was before the Better Helps and all these other companies that, like, were big on advertising, mm -hmm. get connected with a therapist. Yeah. Then after that, um, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, I was more so preaching community because even when it came to the clothing side of things, the first photo shoot we photo shoot we did was the You Matter shoot um, combining the size game uh, Love Yourself shirts with the You Matter hoodies, right? Mm -hmm. Two separate properties. I'm a part of one group, but the other group, I'm not a part of them. I just like bought a whole bunch of their hoodies because we wanted to start advertising what's positive messaging or a positive clothing brand that has a good message mm -hmm. that reinforces the person. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we went from hype me up, love yourself and the you matter brand to me, branch it out more into how are we going to message what's going on with get home safe. And then that's when we came up with the hug a homie concept. Mm. I was at home and I like, I've hugged thousands of people. <laughs> on U Street, mm -hmm. even over at Catholic University, thousands of people, right? Mm -hmm. And like, there was always something about me hugging people that I could see would make a difference in their day. And most, there's a lot of people who don't do body contact, but there's a certain amount of people who do need a certain amount of bodily contact. Mm -hmm. And I forgot uh, what the time frame is, but when you hug people, I think it's for like either eight seconds or close to 15 seconds that creates a chemical that creates trust between you and someone else. Mm. So that's why I came up with the hug a homie concept because like you being homies with someone doesn't mean you trust each other. It just means you believe that you understand who the person is and you know what the relationship both of you guys have, but how do you make that closer? How do you facilitate not just closeness, but a different level of trust outside of what you already have, mm -hmm. right? And when it comes to men, not all men are used to hugging people. Mm -hmm. Women are used to hugging people. But in them being used to hugging people, men have taken advantage of what women do sometimes where it's like, dang, so where my hug at? And it's like, fam, that's a permission thing, mm -hmm. right? And then we went into myself, my care, and get home safe. And the reason I'm layering all three of these things together is there needs to be more community, but community takes empathy. Empathy takes practice. And practice also comes from a place of you need to learn to care about the people, not just from what you can get from them, but actually care about what's going on in their lives. So mm -hmm. for me, I've met so many people that I remember their stories more than I remember their names because when they come and talk to me, they talk to me about their stories and what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
So whether I say their name or not, they've always been big on, hey, man, you remember that thing I was talking to you about, man? So here's what's going on. Like, the amount of people that have sought me out to give me updates and us discuss what's going on, what's going to be the better move yeah. for them has yeah. always been more major than, dang, that nigga don't remember my name. Because it's always been, like, he cares about what my struggle is and what I'm going through. And the, all the people who do know me or know me by name or anything else, they don't actually care about that. And that's actually the most important thing that's going on with me right now. Mm -hmm. So what you're describing is the community that I wish people had more access to or would put effort into creating. But a lot of people don't realize in order to have that, that actually takes sacrifice. Yeah. That community happens because you have struggled together. You have picked each other up. You have cared about the hard things. That allows the people to be vulnerable. And in that vulnerability, it's not just you getting therapy. After you get therapy, you're actually able to share certain parts of yourself with these people who care about you, that will care about the details, that will keep those things in mind when you're going through it, that will understand how to check up on you, how to plan for an emergency if you do have a mental health emergency, mm -hmm. how to plan for, okay... What can we do for you as people that aren't going through it? And what do those boundaries for you look like? And how do we respect who you are, who you need to be right now? Yeah, 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 definitely. And I, I, I do agree with you. There's a, there is a, a, a lack of, a lack of empathy. Mm -hmm. And even, even as far as just wellness and outside of martial arts is concerned. Yeah. Um, one of the things that even in studying to be a personal trainer in the NASM curriculum, National Academy of Sports Medicine, it said one of the first things you learn in that book mm -hmm. is developing a rapport, building trust with yeah. the client. So, in the same manner, it's like, like you said, and a lot of people, they don't even understand the essence of what empathy really means. Yeah. You know, sympathy is different from empathy. Very different. You know, two different things. It's like... Being empathetic and being sympathetic are two very separate topics. Yeah. Like, sympathy is more like, I'm sorry you're going through that. I feel bad for you. But empathy is like, help me truly understand. Help me try to understand to feel what you feel so I can get a, on a better uh, 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 wavelength or really really start to pick apart how what you're going through. You know, it's like, I want to really, uh, like, really put myself in your shoes. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and, and like you said, a lot of us, we, we, we do that, especially in our training because we've been through those things in one form or another and and we try to 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 make experiences relatable in mm -hmm. a sense so yeah it's a big thing and i think that's what we need to do more of especially in the black community yeah because it's, it's very very prevalent and you know you get so many, and you in your line of work you probably get so many kids that just you know look up to you I I do, but it's from a distance. Mm -hmm. It's not built in closeness yet, because mm -hmm. I'm very big on. I actually just had this conversation. Um, for the past two days, this has been a topic for me, right? Um, I'm a cloud architect. I think we've had a chat about that in mm -hmm. terms of what I do on the side, right? And I was sitting in a meeting, and in this meeting, they were talking about imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. right? And I'm very big on, when I sit in meetings with people, I don't correct you in the middle of your work. Because mm -hmm. one of my homies was like, well, why didn't you correct them if you felt they weren't doing a good job? And I framed it and I told them, them coming in to do this meeting about imposter syndrome and everything else, and them not knowing about the work that I do when it comes to mental health relations and wellness relations... I'm not going to criticize someone who is trying, mm -hmm. in the middle of them trying. Mm -hmm. They sat down for the last couple of weeks. They put this pitch together. We're sitting down in the pitch. They're talking about um, imposter syndrome. They're talking about their own story. They're talking about how they've overcome it. And they think that they are making a difference in the office. And they probably are, mm -hmm. right? The issue is, after they've said their story and everyone asks these questions and they're giving people advice... No one is giving action items for the folks who are going to be hyped and excited about all this good advice that you've given them in order to say, okay, well, here's what's next for you if you're dealing with imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the issue that I have right now, especially with a lot of topics that are happening, is a lot of people are having the hard conversation, but there's no action item into, okay, what's next for everybody. 
Yeah. Right? There's a lot of framing and education on things. But now we're getting stuck in this framing and this education and this layering, which builds a good foundation. But if you go with building that foundation for one day and one month and a couple of years, you may be so busy, obsessed with the foundation that you don't actually make progress. Mm -hmm. And what it turns into is you're more happy educating on the topic and saying, we've made a difference because now everyone has the education. But education doesn't always lead to purpose. Mm -hmm. Education doesn't always lead to, all right, there's a changing in the mentality and everyone's behavior now that they've been educated. Education usually just means awareness. Mm -hmm. And awareness is fine, but you do need action items because action items are what leads to change after the education. Mm -hmm. And I wrote them an email and said, look, I do this mental health and wellness outreach, been doing it for five years. Mm -hmm. If y'all ever want to do a sit down so I could critique what you can do better to help you make more of an impact in this conversation, especially if you're going to make time for us to do this, it'd be much appreciated. But if you don't, that's fine. You have the freedom not to do that. It's just, there's always a better version of what you're doing. And in the future, please keep me in mind because there's more of an impact we can do together than you just winging it and patting yourself on the back. And I know that's not what it's about if you're going to take time to touch on this. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I actually shot a video about that because I was pissed last night. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minute video. Real simple. Real slick. Because I was telling folks when it comes to imposter syndrome, um, I think in a certain capacity, you should be allowed to feel things. Like, mm -hmm. you shouldn't be disappointed someone had an experience that's outside of the realm of how you view them. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But with that being said, the issue I have with what they did was you didn't teach them how to hold their own hands when they're not able to find community. Mm. You didn't teach them how to reinforce who they need to be action items wise outside of the office. So what you're creating is a dependency, which that's good in the beginning, but you're not always going to have that capacity to be there for the person if you create a dependency for something that's not your main objective on the regular. Because yeah. what you're looking for is performance. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And it's, it's hard to, to, to push mm -hmm. in on, on one side or, or the other side of that line. It's like, you know, you want to, like you said, create that dependency mm -hmm. early on. Yeah. But what can they do or what, like you said, action items have you established within them that they can do on their own when you're not always necessarily going to be there? Mm -hmm. And the other part of it that I look at is imposter syndrome because I go through this too with, with certain people and even within myself, it's like, I am an advocate for there's no such thing as I can't. Mm -hmm. You are letting the potential for inadequacy to come in but in that i mean in, in imposter syndrome it's like you're, you're telling yourself you can't but sometimes like you say you just need somebody there to push you and mm -hmm. to tell you you can you got it but a lot of times we don't even give enough credit to how far the the uh the idea or the presence of a, of a support system can take you in your journey Whatever it is you're going through, whether you're trying to get another job, whether you're trying to heal from a relationship, whether you're trying to just unlearn character traits or different things or habits and things like that, you know, whatever it is that people are going through and they say, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and you know, even as far as training, and all, what I do is concerned is, is sometimes you just need somebody there to, to be there with you, to tell you, to say, hey, I know you were tired, but let's get up and do this. I know you feel like you can't you know, make it through this last set. You got it. Come on, we got it. You know, and the and the, the, the mantra that I have for myself and that I try to encourage everybody, don't get caught up in comparing yourself to this person and that person. I always say it's you versus you. Mm -hmm. You know, you are creating this version of yourself that you see in the mirror that says, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do it. I've been through so much. I don't know if I can do it. And in reality, a lot of us as, as humans, we go, and we have a goal that we set for ourselves, and we say, oh, okay, I'm just so far from the finish. I don't even see the finish. I don't see the, the bright light at the end of the tunnel. But all you have to do is worry about, okay, can I be a little bit better today than I was yesterday? Mm -hmm. Instead of me saying, I want to be 
and get to my goal. <laughs> and I want it right now. You know, people want that instant gratification, but it's like, no, sometimes you have to go through the process, you have to go through the journey, but a lot of times in terms of mental health, people feel the imposter syndrome, and then they feel, again, that they can't ask for help. Mm -hmm. You know, it's okay to ask for help. And I tell I tell people all the time, it's like, nobody great got to where they are by themselves. Yeah. Everybody had help. Yeah. And you're going to fail more than once. Sometimes two, three, four, five, a dozen times. It's just in certain cases. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of times people give up and they say, well, I've tried it, I've tried it. But have you really gone through the mud? Mm -hmm. Have you really gone through it? And is it that... You kept failing and you and you saying you can't do it. Mm -hmm. Or you just you you haven't really tried it yet. You haven't you, you, you got that you got knocked down twice, so now you wanna quit. Yeah. You know? So it's really, really like and, and, and nothing nothing great comes overnight. You know, it takes time. Everything has a price. Yeah. And uh prices aren't always money. Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's focus. Sometimes it's the relationships that you've built up. So, for example, uh, I use this quite often when uh, people tell me what they want. You have to think about your goals. Like you're the person who it's their birthday and someone wants to get you a birthday cake. Because that's what you want. You want a birthday cake for your birthday. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, that means if you want a birthday cake that a stranger you don't know has to get up at six in the morning to work on the dough. Right, they have to work on icing. They have to work on the branding of the company and having a reputation for serving one of the best cakes the city has ever seen. Mm -hmm. Right, that means someone has to work a job, make money, put in an order to show up and buy that cake and be able to pay for that cake. Mm -hmm. And they now have to move that cake, which takes gas in a car, from one place to another to put the cake on the table in front of you to get candles. That means for the candles, there's either a company. Or a person who's a candle maker that works on the wax, make sure the wax is unscented, put the candles in, they don't explode, they light, and you're fine. Mm -hmm. That means you needed three different people in the room who aren't you, aren't the person or the focus, in order to make this whole birthday cake and everything come together mm -hmm. in order for you to have that one slice of cake. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to your goals or things that you would like to accomplish, that is how you have to think about the things that you want. I want this thing. How many people is it going to take? How many other people who I don't know is it going to take to bring this to life? What are we going to need to manage it? And when it comes to yourself, you are exactly the same thing, whether it's a company or a person. Mm -hmm. And you have to think, hey, am I facilitating these things correctly? And if I'm not, what habits do I need to build and what resources do I need to tap into in order to line this up correctly? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all different moving parts. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it, the worst thing that I think we do to ourselves is like one of the worst types of people I think we can be on earth and in this life is like being don't be upset at the results you didn't get from the work you didn't do oh yeah yeah, yeah. you know yeah I, I have a, I have a